From Sarasota Memorial and the Deb Kavanaugh Multimedia Studio, this is HealthCast, a healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Allison Gottermeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today as we discuss heart failure and new developments when it comes to treating heart failure. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Archer, a cardiologist here in Sarasota. Dr. Archer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Allison. I appreciate the invite. So let's start with the basic, what is heart failure? So heart failure classically is defined really as the heart not being able to keep up the, with the demands of the body. And that seems pretty vague, but it really is whereby the heart just is not meeting the needs and the oxygen demands of, of the body, whether the body's at rest or with activity. So what are the most common symptoms of heart failure? So the most common symptoms are really those of shortness of breath, fatigue, weakness, uh, again, over and above what would be considered normal activity. So when those symptoms begin to develop, you start to worry, you know, what's the cause of those symptoms? And that, those are probably the most common. Other things we hear about are people having difficulty laying flat at night. So they find themselves short of breath, waking up in the middle of the night, coughing, um, and also, I guess signs of symptoms is of heart failure as well would be when you start to have swelling in your legs. Now there's lots of causes of swelling, so it could be somebody had a knee injury. But outside of those sorts of things, if it shows up without any other clear explanation, um, that's always a concern. How common is heart failure truly? It's actually very common. And it's, it's more common than people realize, particularly as the population ages, we're finding more and more patients. So in this, you know, in the last two years, there's a, over six and a half million people with heart failure in the United States. And they're projecting by 2030, it'll be over eight million patients. If someone is having symptoms, they go to a cardiologist, how is heart failure specifically actually diagnosed? So it's really a clinical diagnosis. So there's not exactly one test that helps you for sure to confirm it. Um, it's more a clinical diagnosis. So First and foremost, it's signs and symptoms, and then a physical examination really helps to get you down the right pathway. And then certainly tests, probably the single most helpful test for a cardiologist is an ultrasound of your heart, or what's referred to as an echocardiogram. So I think that those tests and those symptoms all put together really kind of gets us in that pathway of, you know, what, what exactly is happening and, and defining, again, what type of heart failure at that point. And are there different types of heart failure? So there are. We, we think of it really as primarily two types of heart failure. One is where the heart is weak, just like you would expect with any pump that's weak. It's not able to keep up. And as a result, the fluid or blood in this case backs up and causes congestion in the lungs. The other type of heart failure is where the heart's stiff. And that's more common in people that are elderly. And certainly we now know that about half of all of heart failure is when it's a stiff heart pump. And as we all get older, our hearts get a little bit stiff and as a result, can't handle the congestion. And again, fluid backs up and causes symptoms. So again, two types, heart muscle weakness and heart muscle stiffness. We refer to them as systolic heart failure or diastolic heart failure. Are there stages or phases within those two different types? So, and that's a new development probably in the last 10 years where now the cardiology governing bodies have really broken it out into two, two um, sorry, four stages and it's A, B, C, and D. A is where you have risk factors for heart failure. B is where you have some findings on a test to suggest that you may develop heart failure. C is where you actually have the symptoms of heart failure. And then D is where the patients are not responding to the typical treatment for heart failure that then they would be considered more end stage type of heart failure patients. How is the diagnosis likely to progress if undiagnosed or untreated? Yeah, so most patients, it, what ends up happening is they just keep coming back into the hospital with similar symptoms. If they're not appropriately treated, and whether that's, you know, again, something whereby um, they're not following directions, not taking the proper medicines, there's a lot of reasons. Maybe they don't have a good understanding of what they're supposed to be doing, um, but they'll oftentimes continue to represent to the hospital with similar presentation. Are there any non-pharmacologic treatments used to help heart failure patients, or are there any lifestyle changes you suggest if maybe someone 
is at high risk or maybe they know they're in that like AB stage like you talked about? So I, see, I think the biggest thing is really kind of recognizing your risks, you know, as we kind of look at patients, we want to understand is there any family history of heart failure, uh, making good dietary choices, limiting sodium, if they have high blood pressure, treat their blood pressure. Um, those are the main lifestyle types of things. There's really not a, there's not a lot of non-pharmacologic types of things that really oftentimes requires medications to manage it. What are the most common treatments then used by physicians like yourself to treat heart failure? So probably first and foremost to treat the symptoms is really kind of getting the fluid off. So diuretics far, first and foremost are probably what people benefit from the most early on, particularly in the hospital. And then nowadays, there's really four medications that we use. We call them the core four. And I think I, I like to spend a lot of time with my patients to make them understand why we're using all these medicines, because nobody likes to take medicines. And so those four medicines really help to counteract the process, we hope, and uh, control blood pressure. And people don't realize, but the kidneys play a big role in heart failure. And what we realize is the kidneys release certain chemicals and those chemicals then can continue and, and make the process progress. So by blocking those chemicals with these medications, oftentimes patients do much better. And can you touch on the importance of cardiac rehabilitation for this specific population? So I think for us, you know, cardiac rehab is kind of a second step. We really wanna get the patients, their symptoms controlled, their blood pressure controlled. If there's other issues that are causing the heart failure, whether it be heart artery blockages, previous heart attacks. We really want to manage those things first and foremost. But then rehab is really important because again, as you go through the process, invariably people become less active and they become deconditioned. So as they get reconditioned, they have improved exercise tolerance as a result. And that's just a win-win at that point. As I understand it, many patients express concerns about those medicines available to them. Um, how do you help them sort of sort through those concerns? What are the most common concerns you hear? How do you sort through them and find the right treatment for each individual patient? It's a great question. And, and it, it takes, you know, sometimes several office visits to walk people through it and get them to understand the importance of the medicines. Um, they all have a different action. They all have potential different side effects. Um, so frequently what we find is we're checking blood pressure, we're asking them to check blood pressure at home and check weight, look for symptoms. Uh, blood pressure is a big issue because a lot of these medicines, even though they're blood pressure medicines, they're really working on the heart failure. So if they start to have issues whereby they get lightheaded, particularly when they're standing up or walking, you really have to kind of adjust the medicines to accommodate that. And then we also do uh, blood work to make sure that their kidneys are tolerated and their electrolytes are within a normal range. So when we talk about those core four, um, what are those core four and what might someone expect to hear from their cardiologist or if they're seeing you, hear from you, yeah. um, what they should be taking and how do you decide who gets what? Great question again. So it's a really individualistic, oftentimes, in the past, we would always start out with one medication, have them come back in a couple weeks, add a second medication, have them come back in a couple weeks. Now there's really good data in the last five years that shows that basically we should start everybody on all four medicines right away. And even though in the literature that sounds great, truthfully, it's very hard to do that. So oftentimes you kind of assess the patient and there are certain patients that may benefit from certain drugs more immediate than others, maybe a little bit too technical for this for this group at this point, but there's certain medicines we would wanna get patients on right away, particularly the diuretics, and that's not one of the core four. The core four is really what's referred to as a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist, uh, another medication that we refer to as an SGLT2 inhibitor, and again, it's the mechanism with which these medications work, um, and, then, um, and then what's called an ACE inhibitor or an ARNI, so again, they all have different mechanisms of action, but the idea is to make the heart more efficient and help to decongest the patient. So you spoke about the typical treatments. What about someone who has more advanced heart failure? So that's it, my, actually my area of interest, and we, you know, it's, it's always an unfortunate situation. It's always a challenge. These patients are very complicated. 
what we find is that if we get the right care around them, that many of those patients do very well. Um, we have to start looking at more advanced therapies, and oftentimes that's a referral to a center that can provide them other opportunities, including transplant. It would be something whereby we would, again, establish a relationship, uh, reach out to one of these centers, and then have the patient be seen at that center and see if they're a candidate for these more advanced therapies. And many of those patients can then come back and have their follow-up with the physician they're comfortable Absolutely. with. Absolutely. And in fact, just recently, we had a patient that was had a heart transplant um, and is now coming back and following with us. They'll still go back to the transplant center periodically, but we're, we're kind of the in-between. And it would be a similar thing for a patient that had a ventricular assist device implanted. So we have the capability to do all that. It's just a matter of coordinating the care with the, uh, with the center. But to clarify again, those are only the most advanced cases. Not Correct. everyone who comes to you um, with symptoms is going to end up needing to take those steps. Correct. And there are some other devices now that just in the past two years, um, patients may benefit from that we do here locally. And uh, some of those are just within the past six months, we've been, been able to implant some of these more novel devices that are really taking off all, all around the country. So I'd like to think we're really, we're, we're on the, uh, the doorstep of really providing, you know, uh, unbelievable care here, you know, that you could get anywhere. And uh, we're proud of that. And some of that is part of clinical research. I just wanna touch on how important do you think it is that a public hospital like Sarasota Memorial has such a robust clinical research center, clinical research institute that is on the forefront of some of these emerging technologies and devices. Yeah, it's it's actually incredible. From from where I came, um, there was not as much of that engagement, and and I have been just floored by the engagement of the physicians and all the the people involved with that type of program. It's been incredible, and really exciting for us for the future to be able to bring more technologies as we are participating in the trials. What kind of advancements and new developments in treatment have you seen in the last you know, five to 10 years? Yeah, it's really an exciting time to be honest. We really know that these four medications now, again, within the past five years, there's just unbelievable data, how we're really making a difference with those medications as long as the patients are compliant. And I like to describe it, I don't think it's too technical for people to understand, but we oftentimes use a statistic in medication, or excuse me, in medicine, referred to as the number needed to treat. And most times if you find a medication where you only need to treat two or three patients out of maybe 10 that patients benefit from, in this case, if you can get you know, patients on those four medications, you really only need to treat four patients before you see one patient with a response. So that's pretty incredible. And we really do see patients that go from either a weak heart or lots of symptoms, you get them on these medications and all of a sudden, they're able to go back to walk into the mailbox and be in the very functional again. So that's, that's really important. From a, a device standpoint, also a very exciting time. There's some real innovative devices for a select group of patients that qualify for those that really can make a difference and really improve their functional abilities. So who is specifically referred to a heart failure specialist and what does that process for referral look like? Yeah, great question. I think for us, um, you know, I think the conversation really should be with your primary care doctor and your cardiologist about, you know, I always encourage patients ask questions of your healthcare provider, regardless of who it is. And I think if it falls into a situation whereby their heart failure is either difficult to manage or there's been challenges or repeat hospitalizations, those patients that just aren't responding as you would expect to the medications, um, those are the patients that really we should be seeing. And there may be patients whereby it's a good idea just to kind of get on board and say, let's see a, you know, a time or two or once a year, make sure they're on the right medication. And then they have a fallback so that if there is challenges going forward, they've established a relationship with a heart failure doctor. Can you cure heart failure or is it a lifelong treatment? You know, it's a good question. I, I would like to say that we could cure it. Um, there are patients that respond tremendously. Um, this conversation has been ongoing for many years in the heart failure world and meetings is once you have heart failure, can you ever come off the medications? As much as I'd like to say yes, and we'd all like to say yes, 
Um, for most of us, we really feel that there should be at least a baseline of certain medications to keep those patients on to really keep them compensated and keep the heart failure from coming back. Can you talk specifically about the heart failure clinic at Sarasota Memorial, what that is and why it's unique? I've been such an, it's been such an honor to join this heart failure clinic because it's been so successful over the years. Um, but it, the concept is really to have a group of providers and we have nurse practitioners and PAs that work there to help us extend our abilities to be able to take care of these patients. What we know is it does take a lot of time and a lot of visits to not only educate patients, but also to monitor and titrate the medications. So we wanna get patients on the medicines right away, but we also wanna titrate those medicines. There's lots of studies that show the higher the dose, the more likely to have a response. But it's, again, it takes some sophistication and some knowledge and some understanding of the, the uh, pluses and minuses there, particularly as it relates to the kidney function and the blood pressure. So the heart failure clinic uh, has been excellent. Uh, they do a f fantastic job. We have gals and guys that have lots of experience doing this. Um, and then it also keeps you in front of somebody who is also looking at other options for you. So there are patients that might have other options, whether it be a device or other types of interventions that really might help the patients beyond medications to, to help move their care forward. And it must be reassuring to patients, not only to see the same providers, uh, and have that same level of uh, expertise amongst those providers, but also to know that those providers are the same ones doing their follow-up because you develop relationships with these 100%. patients, right? You said you nailed it right on the head. We really, I mean, it really does become kind of a family. So you get to know these patients intimately well. You know, they have a pretty um, guarded prognosis. And so you really want to provide and be aggressive with their care, but you really do get to know them and their families and their, and their care providers. Um, and we really focus on a collaborative approach. So we work with their cardiologists, we work with their primary care physicians to extend the care and uh, it becomes a team effort and it's always well received. What's your message to patients or families concerned about symptoms of heart failure or who have recently been diagnosed with some, sta some stage of heart failure? I think the biggest thing is patients need, when they walk into their doctor, they need to ask questions. And it's never wrong to ask questions. You shouldn't be embarrassed. You should just ask questions. And particularly patients who have had recurrent events to the hospital, we know that's a significant prognostic factor. So if you're in the hospital in the course of two, twice a year, three times a year, that's a real concern of ours because their prognosis is not as good. So ask questions um, if you feel like there would be benefit from seeing it, uh, you know, again, from a primary care physician to a cardiologist to a heart failure specialist. It may be that you have to go to that level to get, get better care and a better outcome. Anything else you'd like to add? I know we've covered a lot of topics today. I think that's really good. I, my, my big message was really to get people to ask questions. And, and when they see their providers, you know, what are the options? Are there other options to treat, particularly patients that have a lot of other disease processes? Heart failure can complicate management of all those. So sometimes it's a very complicated situation. And you just want to have a better understanding, a better grasp, and understand the expectations. and. A lot of patients can help themselves if they just watch their diet, they watch their blood pressure, they watch their weight. Those types of things really help us take better care of them. All right, Dr. Archer, thank you so much for joining us today and answering all these questions. As always, we encourage everyone in our community to visit smh.com to get the latest from Sarasota Memorial. Have a great day.